Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Resiliency Series. My name is John Andrew Williams. Today, we're going to be joined by Sonia Bandari from Nairobi, Kenya. And we are going to see, I just was chatting with her over in another Zoom room, so it might take a second for her to arrive. Here she is. Hello, Sonia. How are you? Sorry, just video here. Excellent. Excellent. Ashley, you're the host now. So, John, I'm actually saying I can't get onto my video because the host has stopped it. Interesting. So, give one sec and we can, um, Sonia, I'm going to make you a co-host and then it should let you start your video. If you try now. Okay. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. Thank Welcome, you. everybody, to the Resiliency Series. We're joined with Sonia Bandari, one of our trainers here from at Coach Training EDU. And if you know anyone who uh, is wanting to join here, I want to share the link. If you have any uh, friends who want to join the webinar, here is the link. I am super excited to have a Me conversation too. with you and uh, Sonia. Here we go. Go and then let me do one more thing. Make sure we're all set to go. Perfect. All right. We're all set. Well, welcome. Welcome, Sonia. And I just want to start with saying thank you. It was so inspiring just to hear your story last week. And, uh, oh, here, hold on, Amy, let me get that link, that, that link again. Uh, it was so inspiring to hear your story last week. Let's start with that. Let's start with uh, where, where do you live now? What, what are you up to? What, yeah, and yeah, let's just start there. Where do you live? What are you up to? Who are you? <laughs> Okay, so I live in Nairobi, Kenya, where I've lived for almost two decades. Um, I was born in England and brought up in Canada. I met my husband in Kenya, so I moved here two decades ago when we got married. So as I was telling you the other day, John, um, I think a big turning point for me in my story and who I am uh, happened about six years ago, actually just over six years ago. I found that when I moved to Kenya, I actually started living in, in a state and a feeling of fear a lot of the time. And, and it was really stopping me from just being joyful in my life. Everything was filtered through this lens of fear. So by, by chance, actually, one day on a WhatsApp group, there was a message and a link to a course, uh, a personal safety workshop for women. And it was starting the next day. I knew nothing about it. All I knew is that I had set an intention about six months prior to that, that I wanted to empower myself by taking uh, a security course of some sort. So it was almost like the universe kind of handed it to me. Um, and so without even giving it a second thought, I signed up and I walked in the next day. And wow, that was a life-changing experience. Um, I walked in and the usual me from like four decades of, of just being this really timid, shy person, I actually walked to the back of the classroom. And I said, okay, let me just sit at the back and hope no one asks me anything. Um, that's how I've been my whole life. Um, and then I realized, well, wait a minute, I've come here to empower myself. So that means I need to step out of my comfort zone. And so I actually made the conscious effort to go sit right up front. Um, and so the class started and the instructor was wonderful, very approachable, very kind. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm looking forward to learning from this lady. And she asked me, um, well, she asked the class, can I, can I have a volunteer because I wanna simulate uh, a situation. So again, I was like, okay, let me step out of my comfort zone. And I put up my hand, I very bravely, boldly offered myself as the demo. Uh, little did I know that this very kind, approachable woman was going to transform like that. 
And the next thing I knew, she was shouting at me, she was pulling my hair, she was smacking me, and she was intimidating me with, with an intimidating dummy weapon for, for training purposes. And somehow, I have no idea till now, somehow I was able to do whatever I was meant to do in the best way possible. And so she stopped the simulation and I sat down and I actually broke down into tears because what she didn't realize and what no one else in that class realized is that she had just simulated my worst case scenario in my mind. And so there was a lot of emotion that was happening and I just burst out. I burst, burst into tears. And it was interesting because rather than give me some compassion in that moment, she actually came to me and said, wow, you should have told me you cry so easily. And I have to say that moment, that one sentence for me, it, it flipped a switch. I was like, okay, I have, I have a choice right now, John. I had a choice in that moment. Am I gonna go back into my kind of fear-filled shell that I've been living in all my life? Or am I gonna step out of that and rise to the occasion? And I don't know what it was within me, but I chose option number two. Uh -huh. And by the end of that two days, I was a different person. So when you, when you tapped into that, what was the most surprising part of tapping into that part of yourself? <sighs> I think just how much control I suddenly feel, like I suddenly felt. Like it's like I was kind of navigating my world, never having a sense of control. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I was like, hey, this is what control feels like. This is what control over my own personal safety feels like. So it was an incredible moment for me. Thanks for sharing, Sonia. It reminds me a lot of what I think a lot of people are experiencing on a much slower trajectory right now with the shock to you know, the health system, economic system, family system, work system, every, all the systems are receiving basically the equivalent of that person coming at them <laughs> and yeah. finding this resilience in why we're doing this resilience series as to come together as a community, provide inspiration and wisdom and support. What, after, after that experience with finding that aspect of yourself, what changed? Like what else, like what areas of your life had to catch up to that moment? Wow. I would say everything had to catch up. Um, as soon as that class ended a day later, I went straight to the instructor because I knew this was not the end for me. It was only the beginning. And I went straight up to him and I asked him, well, what else can I do? Right. And from that point on, this was in December, 2013. From that point on, I showed up for every single training they had. I would show up when there was no training. Like they could not get rid of me because I was, I couldn't get enough of it. Eventually I actually started working with them as well. And we started a weekly ladies self-defense training group, which is still ongoing till now. Um, and from there, we've all grown. Um, yeah, so that, that was six and a half years ago. And I think about two and a half years into that experience, John, I woke up one day and I recognized that I was a very different person. Um, something had shifted on an emotional level, a mental level, a spiritual level, and a physical level. Um, and I knew it was a sense of empowerment, this just feeling of peace that I felt safe and in control. And that's when I decided I need to somehow pass this forward to others. So when you see others, and the work that you're doing now, I know in Nairobi with you know, women and girls, what, what, what do you see or what's the moment in their transformation that you're, you're looking for or seeking after? There's, there's quite a few things that I, I kind of seek to pass forward. One of the big things is a shift in their mindset uh, from I can't do this or I'm not very strong. They come in with a lot of limiting beliefs whether they're related to self-defense training 
or otherwise, they do come about as we work together and as we spend time together. And so what I want to pass forward is you are valuable. And if you believe in your mind, this is the big thing for me. If you believe in your mind that you can do something, your body will follow through. Anything is possible. And that's what our self-defense techniques teach. And I really like to translate that into the coaching world as I coach them as well. And a lot of them have walked away or a lot of them have come back, sent me messages and just told me that you're, you're changing my life. I am stepping out of my comfort zone in so many ways. I'm transforming on so many levels. I'm feeling empowered in so many ways. Um, and that's exactly what I want to do. I never felt like I found that space in my life to kind of reach within and empower myself and shift my limiting beliefs. And so that's what I want to give to others right now through self-defense training and through coaching. What's the... Is What's the, what's the common, or I guess, what, what's the connection when you find that part of yourself in self-defense, like in the, the body, and, where, and find that self as a coach? What's the common thread between the two? Uh, it's all about the mind. It right. is all about the mind. When I'm teaching, there's two things. One, it's all about the mind. If you believe it in your mind, every cell, every energy, everything within your body will follow through, which is very similar to the coaching field, right? If we can shift and we can clear our headspace, then the rest of us will follow through on the actions needed. Right. And then the second thing is, um, so there was mindset, just you know, the mind and the body following the mind. And I've lost track of what I was going to say, the second really important thing. Uh, but it will come to me. It will come to me, John. Well, it reminds me of the coaching when, you know, when you're working with a client and you're coaching with a client. And it feels sometimes like we are both entering a, a bubble of alternate reality where we get to play with ideas and thoughts and emotion that you don't necessarily get to play with in your real life. You know, yeah. And, uh, some of the, the one uh, recently in putting together the updates to the 1.0 is we did a ton of research in positive psychology. One of the things that struck me was this idea between being in a learning zone versus a performance zone. And so much, so much of the time, I, I think we're forced to be in that performance zone, especially around like around, you know, relationships, business, like everything. It's always, you know, can you perform? Can you perform? But really allowing yourself to to learn and it's not necessarily about things even outside yourself but to learn about that internal landscape like that part of yourself that was there but rarely visited uh, so I guess my, my question is is that I feel, I feel like the part those parts of us are there and then we discover them but what's the what's the relationship between you know, discovering that part of yourself and creating a new part or having you know uh like how much does it feel like you're discovering it versus you're creating that part uh well there's definitely a, a connection between the two i think as we train in self-defense um i recognize the words that come out of my clients and my students uh like what comes from them. And it's often, well, I can't do that. I'm not good at this. I'm not so good at that. There's a, so there's a lot of limiting beliefs that come out. And so I always stop in that moment and I ask them to reframe that. Uh, because if there's any doubt in your mind in regards to training, if there's any doubt in your mind in regards to, to life in general, well, again, we will follow through with that, right? And so in terms of discovering, we're creating a space, a very safe space in our training to face your fears. And once you start facing your fears and you recognize that you have options and you recognize you're capable of so much more, not only do the limiting beliefs come up, but it also gives you an opportunity to recreate those beliefs. So I think it's, that's where the learning comes in. When you, when you hear yourself saying, and I pointed out that, why are you saying you're not good at this? And what would you like to be good at? And so I often say when I'm doing it in the version of a, an empowerment workshop, 
not just self-defense training, then I'm really tackling the mind and the spirit and the body. And so I like to ask the question, well, who do you want to step into? Who do you want to be in this moment? Who do you need to be to make this work for you? So there's discovery and then there's the creation of, well, I can, I've discovered this, I can let it go and now I can recreate or reframe how I wish to be. Wow, so it's a process of like rework, it's almost like a process of reworking the landscape, like asking yourself, what parts of this do I want to emphasize and what parts do I need, do I want to let go? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, also, sorry, it just came to me what I wanted to mention earlier. The other thing that we really tackle is opportunity. Um, we work on the mindset and then I really point out opportunity. So when, when I start training, I always start with a really simple technique, which is um, a wrist grab. Imagine someone has grabbed your wrist and what is the natural human tendency in that moment? It's to pull your own wrist towards you. So as a result, what happens to the grip on that wrist? It increases. Yeah, it becomes stronger. So if all our focus is going towards that, what have we just done to that particular problem? We've given it energy and we've just made it worse. Right. But if I'm able to step out of my tunnel vision and take a look, you've grabbed my wrist, but I have my whole body. I have your whole body and all of that is available to me. And again, I see that as opportunity. And I, I feel like that's really applicable to life. That when we have a problem or a challenge, what happens? We tunnel vision in, right? And all we think about is that problem and that challenge. And what happens? We're energizing it and we're making it grow. And once we take a step back and we open up our vision, that's when we start to see all the opportunities and all the possibilities. And that's how I relate the two. Well, that's lovely. I can feel that metaphor, like really feel it. Uh, Thank you. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I wrestled through high school and college and like the body, I mean, the, the connection between the body and the mind is I think something that uh, I don't want to take for granted. You know, I know that, that feeling when you find that resilience in yourself. Uh, yeah. how, how have you applied it to the current situation? Like with everything shutting down and all of this, like what, how are you applying that same idea? Um, opportunity, uh, hope and vision is what comes to mind when you ask me that. Um, as much as there's so much going on out there that I have no control over, it's the same thing. Okay, I, I don't have control over that, but what do I have control over within, within myself? Um, and I can find balance within myself. I can make the best use of my time right now at home with my kids. Um, I'm working on you know, projects that I have kind of shelved because I didn't have the time because I was always running around. So I'm making the effort to make the most productive use of my time right now. And when I speak about hope and vision, for me, these are huge tools that I think we often disregard. And I know from experience that those two things can, can really get you through challenges. Um, in, in the three years that I was really exploring becoming a trainer and becoming an instructor and coach, in those three years, I had three knee injuries and a double bout of pneumonia. And every single time, it was the vision of what I want in the future that got me through it. I would actually be going in for surgery, they'd be giving me anesthesia, and my mind would be focused on, okay, four weeks from now, six weeks from now, I'm gonna be stronger, I'm gonna have more stamina, and I'm gonna be back into work and I'm gonna be better than ever. And each time that was exactly the case. And I absolutely believe that that is what got me through all those moments. And so when I speak of hope and vision, I am envisioning a few months down the line where, yeah, this was a really challenging moment, but there is gonna be a future to look forward to. And there is gonna be work that I need to do and everyone around me. Right. 
All right. It reminds me of uh, what was it, Jonathan Haid, this book. Uh, what is or that one? Is it Dan Gilbert? The idea of next thing. How? What's unique about humans? You know what we can do that separates us from most other animals is this idea of uh, next thing. You know, like animals can next. They can think of okay, what's going to happen next? Like a crow hits on a seed, it opens, they eat it. Great. But human beings, it's that imagination. It's our ability to be able to put ourselves in the future that's yeah. unique to us. And uh, this idea. That, that it's exactly what you're talking about. This idea to create a reality that has not yet come to pass and to make yeah. that vision as real as the present moment, even more real than the present moment. Absolutely. That's it. That, that's the practice you're speaking to. Absolutely. Uh, wow. So when you're, um, what does, what, how does, being in touch with that resilient part of yourself impact that vision. And what happens when that vision comes true? Like what does the, the vision, you know, past visions coming true, how does that impact the resilient part of you? Again, it, it's just shown me how powerful we can be as individuals. Right. We really have a choice in every single moment we can choose to kind of enter this negative perspective whereby we see the problems as, as just that and we lose focus on all the good stuff that's happening and all that we have in our life. Um, and just being able to get through prior challenges has shown me it's possible. And I have, like everyone else, a lot of different perspectives I have to take in all different moments. And so through all my training this last six years, personal safety and self-defense and some very intense moments in self-defense training. And then there's the coaching side. I'm, I'm finding this balance whereby I need to be prepared and I need to be aware of the reality of the situation. Um, but then there's also this very positive, hopeful, uh, empathetic, compassionate coaching persona of mine and so I like to think that right now I'm really trying to find the balance between the two of those to find a way whereby I know we're facing a huge struggle, but I also very strongly believe we have to get through it in order to get through it. Again, the mind will follow. I mean, the body will follow the mind. If I succumb to the stress. Yeah. It's lately I've been feeling a deep sense of optimism for the state of humanity in the world. You know, especially when thinking about, I was talking to a friend yesterday about how the, the environmental impact of all this is amazing. Like all these scientists are now going to have hard data of what happens if human beings stop doing what we're doing. That This ultimately might help, you know, generations from now. This might be a, a huge uh, benefit to the environment and what we're able to do moving forward. Uh, I'm curious, what's the, cause you're, cause you're in Kenya, but you were born in Canada? No, I was actually born in England. England. Okay. But you lived in Canada. So you, the yeah. So you, what's the, what, what are you noticing or what are the cultural differences between, you know, UK, Canada, US, Kenya, in, in this kind of, a, if, if, if any, in, in sort of this realm of, um, hmm, okay. I can't say much about the UK because we moved from there when I was three. Um, when I think, when I speak to my parents in Canada, it, I think it felt like everyone was taking me seriously a lot sooner than perhaps we are here. Now everyone is. I think it was just that whole disbelief that this can't happen. Right. Um, so there was a lot of that. And then there's a very big cultural difference in, in personal space. Um, and I, I really struggled with that when I moved here. And I think in Canada, it's on a very subconscious level, we respect personal space and, you know, we will never go within arm's length of someone we don't know. We, we, we understand that it's part of the culture, but in Kenya, it's not, and it's not out of choice. It's because they don't have the luxury of space. 
Um, so now when all of a sudden we're told to practice social distancing, people are struggling with that and they're not quite understanding. So that's definitely a challenge right now. As you go everywhere, people are still coming up and you know, I'm finding myself having to use my voice, which I'm glad I've learned how to do, and actually just say, could you, could you just stop right there or create that, re reset my own space if I have to. So, so that's been interesting, yeah. One thing I've found interesting in, in working with the people from all over the world as a coach and as, as a trainer is that once you break through that cultural crust, which sometimes is very flimsy, human beings are surprisingly similar in our hopes, dreams, and desires, uh, yeah. no matter where, you know, and uh, a lot of it, I think, comes down to uh, culture does, culture works on some level, you call, culture works deep on some level, but there are other levels that culture doesn't quite get to, uh, simply because I think, feel like coaching is a, almost like a new technology of communication like a new way of asking questions and a new way of exploring. Uh, what do you think, what, what, when you look at this, what, what do you think is going to happen to the coaching field or this whole idea of you know, personal growth and development? How is, how is COVID-19 having an impact on this field of development, personal, professional development? I think coaching could potentially play a big part in the world right now. Um, just the, lear the learning that we have as coaches and the safe space that we're really ingrained to, to give to others um, and that coaching relationship that we form, I think it gives people an opportunity to, to voice their fears and their concerns. And it gives us an opportunity as coaches to help them to shift that. And I think that's huge right now because I strongly believe that if we can all shift just what our headspace right now, and we can all focus on hope and vision and put proactive action into place, we can make a change, right? And we're, I very much believe in the law of the universe. So if we can collectively consciously put that energy out there, we can create a change. So I feel like coaching right now can just provide a huge service um, to what people are experiencing in this moment. And I personally have offered here coaching in exchange. Um, if finances are an issue, which I totally understand they are, then what service can you offer in return? And if you cannot offer a service, that's also okay. Pass forward a good deed to someone else. Right, right. Well, that's kind of an offer I've put out there. Right. That's lovely. I was, I've been reading, so we have three year olds and I've been reading him space books at nighttime. And one of, uh, you know, the, the perfect thing to put a three year old to sleep. And it's fascinating to talk, think about in one, in one of the pages, it talks about how uh, human beings, not because we're now conscious of ourselves, that this is, it's, it's another, it's a form of energy. Like basically consciousness is another form of energy. And this idea that we're now like the stars are able to see themselves because human beings can see them. Like it's like human beings are uh, like that, like what you're, what you're speaking to there, there's an energy, you can measure it. Where, where do you see, I mean, I feel like human, human beings are coming together in, in a beautiful way right now. Like there's a lot of, of really, like people helping each other and being supportive and understanding and compassionate. Uh, I guess my question, or I'm just curious more about, uh, we talked about the drama triangle, you know, the difference between uh, uh, the, the, you know, the uh, persecutor, the rescuer and the victim, right? Like that, that drama, the Cartman drama triangle. Uh, what was your journey from, what was your journey in that triangle? between, and I have a, uh, I have a, uh, I have a, 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 what's it called? <laughs> a graphic here. There we go. Yeah, what was your journey between, I'll share my screen here in a second. Sure. Okay, excellent. 
what was your journey between the the you know the rescuer, the victim, and the persecutor in this triangle? Yeah, um, interestingly. I, I recognize that we each have those three roles within us um, and we can easily shift from one to the other. And again, when I started this training six years ago, um, I very much viewed all my circumstances in life, all my challenges from the victim, the, the poor me perspective, very much so. And, and by default, as we talk about in coaching and in the assumptions, while I was viewing it through that lens of the victim, well, all I was seeing is everything that was going to support that view, which to me then reinforced that, yes, I was the victim. Everything is happening to me. And so as I started all this training, uh, like I said, I, I experienced a mental, emotional, spiritual shift, and it was a harsh reality to myself, and I had to own up to the role I was playing in my life. And I realized that it was very easy for me to default into this poor me persona. And as I was able to recognize that and kind of let go of these thought patterns and, and heal pain from the past and let go of limiting beliefs, I shifted kind of to my own rescuer. And then as I, I realized how much I had empowered myself and how, how incredible and energizing it felt to shift from that poor me perspective, how much becomes available to you when you can do that. I went into this rescuer mode where I wanted to rescue everyone suddenly. So anyone who, who kind of appeared like they were in a little bit of a poor me scenario, I would want to go and shift their whole life. And, and so I've had to really find the balance between realizing when I can support someone and when I need to back off and allow them to actually step out of that role themselves. Um, in terms of the persecutor, I, I have become so aware. It's almost like I can step out of myself and witness myself in scenarios. And I can witness that I'm stepping back into victim role. And I'll actually start questioning myself and almost bullying myself into why I'm doing that. And I'll have to consciously make a choice to, you know, to feel the emotions of the victim and the poor me and then make a choice to step out of that and step out into the empowered version of myself that I have taken a lot of time to create. Right, right. Yeah, here's, uh, yeah, here's the shifting. Here's the, the one that, you know, the, the shift, right? From, so it's shifting from, you know, being a victim, you know, I mean, basically what the drama triangle says is that anytime there's something that we're, that we're in, you know, anytime there's a, drama, anytime there's a challenge, we usually find ourselves in one of these three roles, right? Either the one who's, no, that's not going to work. Like, I'm going to come in and make it, make it fix, you know, I want to fix it. Or, you know, like that person's bad. Uh, and they go after the, the bad person, <laughs> the bad guy or a rescuer. I want to go help the victim, right? I'm going to go help and, uh, or the victim. And the, the premise is that no matter where we, how we enter it, most people, end up in victim role or, you know, ourselves, like our, our view of ourselves. Uh, and, you know, shifting that, I think what you're speaking to is shifting from persecutor to assertive, rescuer to caring, from victim to vulnerable, you know, and, and making that, making that shift. Uh, in your own coaching practice, what, what do you see or what what impact do you see coaching has like in your practice and in using you know in in moving people from you know in this triangle to to mm. this one uh well clients usually come with a very specific feel or a very specific topic and i find that they're they're so stuck within that that scenario that they're not able to see anything else and so looking at it from outside, it feels very much like they're stuck in potentially um, that victim mode that this is happening to me. He or she or this or that is been said to me or done to me. And so what I love about coaching and what I love about just all the little tools is that if we can clear that headspace, 
and be really open and honest and also give them a space to feel it. I think it's important not to just kind of shove it to one side, but allow them to be validated. And that's what I love about coaching. We listen, we create that space that is not created in any other relationship, right? We allow our client to just open up and voice what they need to because they don't get that opportunity. And once they do and they just let that go, that's when they can kind of shift their energy, right? Right. And that's when they can shift their perception. Once they're validated, but until they get that space to voice what's happening in here and here, they can't shift. And I think that's been the big thing for me is that people just need a safe space. They need compassion. They just need to be heard. They need to be felt. As, as the minute you give them that space, then they're willing to empower themselves and shift from that poor me victim role. Brian, Brian. So Sonia, let's, let's shift to Q and some Q and A because there are some great questions coming in from just to us. Uh, if you if you want to use at the bottom, uh, there's a Q and A set uh, button there that you can basically ask open question. Everyone can see it. That would be fantastic. And Joyce, I got your question. Uh, I'm going to read it because it's it's amazing. Uh, so Sonia, uh, this is from Joyce. Uh, she she asks, I have a coaching practice of moms and teens with severe autism. A common problem is how to handle physical address physical aggression from our beloved children who unfortunately have only partial control over their bodies and sometimes get hijacked uh, by anxiety and sensory hypersensitivities and go into fight or flight. Would you consider doing a self-defense class for moms so they can learn how to keep their adult teens safe and keep their bodies under control without hurting them? Do you, do you know such techniques? Uh, or do, if not, do you have a good referral? This could be life-changing for families with this problem. Wow, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, I'm going to be completely honest and say I've never dealt with something like that in particular. Mm -hmm. But I would be more than happy to, to actually look into it and research it and see what could be possible in that particular scenario. Right. Um, so, so Joyce, I mean, I, I want to be really transparent and authentic and tell you that, again, I haven't dealt with that in particular. I can think of ways to, yes, whereby you can control someone who's being aggressive. Um, there would definitely have to be a way to do it where you're not hurting them and also you are also safe. But I would definitely like to do more research into that and I'm happy to provide information to you to the best of my ability if you'd like to share your information later. Right. So when you're in self-defense, right? When you're in self-defense mode, what what are you after? Like, what's the what's the goal that you're trying to achieve in that situation? Well, one of the important things we always teach is self-defense is your absolute physical self-defense is your last line of defense. It's your last option. Before you even get to that point, we teach awareness, meaning you know, get off your phone. Um, be conscious of how you're walking, take a look at your surroundings, understand what's happening around you. Um, because you can avoid so much if you just create that sense of awareness. And then to back that up, we talk about um, space management. So if you're aware of your personal space, which we say is usually like arm's length around us, if you're cautious of that, then, then you know what's happening around you. Um, and then if you notice someone approaching you and you're able to use your voice, which we also teach, um, you can stop someone from coming any closer just by saying stop or get back. And there's a few things that happen with raising your voice and using your voice, John. One is that we can go into tunnel vision when someone's approaching and we're feeling a sense of fear. We stop breathing. Um, and so we become an easy target for them. So by using our voice, there's three things that happen. One, we break free from that tunnel vision. Two, we allow ourselves to breathe. And three, we catch the, the opponent or the aggressor off, off guard. And we, we attract attention around us. So we always say physical self-defense is when you have no other choice. You've tried everything else. And now someone's grabbed you and they're physically harming you. Wow. So it's like, it's almost like you're you're using the energy, like your voice and the energy, like it's like an energy bubble that you have. 
Absolutely. And so when we present the program, it's, it's like a lot of focus on awareness and be, be situationally aware of your surroundings and, and your personal space. And when you're walking from your car to your home or to the mall and where are you is an isolated area. We really focus a lot on that. Wow. Um, it is key. Right, right. All right, we have another question here. Uh, it's from a mice. Uh, she says, she, uh, she says, I'd love to hear, uh, do you work with teens and what impact have you seen your coaching and empowerment workshops have on the lives? Yes, I actually um, spent a lot of my time designing workshops and providing regular self-defense training for teenage girls between the ages of seven, uh, 12 and 18. Um, and I really approach it again in the same way I just did. I talk about personal awareness and I talk about the fact that you can walk away from a situa situation and I really emphasize that just because you know physical tools, that does not mean that if someone upsets you, you go and you punch them out. It's not about that. It's about having this secret little tool for you to walk around with more confidence. And so I also incorporate and integrate body language. What's powerful body language? Uh, what's timid body language? What's the difference between the two? Um, and I give little pep talks in class as well. And we have a relaxation segment. So the impact that I have seen is that they grow in their confidence and they grow in their ability to, to, you know, try out a new technique and they overcome fear. And I try my best to say that if this works here, it can also work in other areas of your life. If you can step out of your comfort zone here, you can also do it elsewhere. Um, and so they see a lot, like a lot of times when I show them a technique, they look at me like, are you crazy? I can't do that. And literally 10 minutes later, they're fooling around, they're laughing and they're doing it like fabulously. In fact, they learn it so much quicker than adults do. And I always ask them, do you remember how you were limiting yourself 10 minutes ago saying, I can't do that. And look at you 10 minutes later. Right. So apply that to everything else. Take right. away that that I can't and, and decide in your mind that you can because your body will follow through. So let's, let's do one. So what, what's the technique? Can you, can you show me a technique, a, a personal self-defense technique? Oh gosh, how do I show you now without another person? Huh, interesting. Well, you can pretend like we can, you, we can just, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> okay, well, if you get an opportunity later on uh, with your beautiful wife, um, if you just grab a wrist, okay, and like I said, I mentioned that if you grab my wrist and you stretch it out and it's far away from my body, I am less strong than when I bring my, my um, elbow to my body. Right. So stronger when our limbs are closer to us. So again, when I said that, you know, if someone takes my wrist and I pull it, their grip is going to get stronger. So I need to take a look at everything else I have available to me. And what I'm going to do is we refer to it as basing, which is our foundation, our footwork. So we want to be really stable and I want to be, I want to have my legs shoulder width apart. Um, and I want to find a way to bring my elbow to my body. Um, so if I can't pull it because I'm not necessarily stronger than my opponent, then I bring my feet, my legs, I use my legs and move into my opponent. So this tends to be counterintuitive because we think we want to pull ourselves away from our right. opponent. But actually, you're much stronger when you get in close. You have a lot more power. So I always say that, okay, if you stick your arm out and then you just pull it in, and then if I just pull it to my chest, and create an anchor and secure it here and just take my elbow over like this, I can break that wrist hold very easily. Because if you think about your wrist, your hand uh, grabbing, it's actually just the four, it's the thumb. That's the grip you need to break. It's not the four fingers. So by just doing this action where I pull that into me and secure it and just take my elbow over, and keeping this all tight. We refer to this as friction. So we really refer in self-defense not to muscle and strength, but to friction. So I'm using like my chest as a third arm here and pulling my elbow through. It actually will release that wrist hold. Right, right. So essentially what you're doing is, is uh, 
I mean, it's surprising for me how much emotion this is bringing up. Like, I'm always just saying, uh, I love this so much. What a gift for teen girls. So powerful to pair with coaching tools. Uh, if you ever want to offer an online course, I know girls who'd love to join. My girls. I'm thinking of my girls, too. And thinking, like, what you're doing is you're teaching them essentially wrestling. I mean, from my perspective, it's, it's I mean, it's like principles of wrestling, right? Like, where you know, talking about footwork, where you put things and what, what you're doing essentially is instead of running away from the challenge, you're going into the challenge. Like you're looking at this, not as just an opportunity to defend yourself, but this is, this is where life is, in, this is where life is requiring you to engage 100% when it matters. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's two things that come to mind when you talk about combining the self-defense and how empowering it can be for, for teen girls combined with coaching, because what I'm trying to get at with them is understanding their value. Right. Because I was talking about how we use our body language and we use our voice. And also I teach them how to set boundaries. You won't do any of that if you don't have value in yourself. Right. And you will not fight when you need to, unless you have value for yourself. So self-value, self-worth. So that's a big part of it. And then the other thing, like you said, when it comes down to it, you have to fight for your life. Um, and so there's this really great saying that my, my instructor, my mentor for the, from the last six years always says, really simple, stay in the fight. Um, and basically it just means that, you know, if you're now fighting for you to protect you, you cannot do it half-heartedly. You cannot do it... Um, with this much effort, and if it fails, say, uh oh, okay, it didn't work, now what? You put your full intention into it, and if it doesn't work, you do something else, you stay committed. And so, his one phrase is just stay in the fight. Right, right. It's a mindset that you're yeah, in. I love that. It's, it's going into it. It's not, it's, it's almost like if the fight's here, then you have to fight it. Like you can't pretend that it's not there. Yeah. And I think that's the, the surprising thing is I feel like it, it flips it. You know, if we're going back to the triangle, it flips it from, you know, being the victim to then being assertive, you know, and then all of a sudden the aggressor now becomes the new victim. It's like, it's almost flipping the role. Like, whoa, wait a second. Like now this is not the situation that they were thinking it was going to be. Absolutely. And, and absolutely. So much power. And the other thing is that voice really comes into that. Right. Um, even just being able to shout throws off your attacker and it allows you to breathe and it kind of taps into that power within. So again, as, as you know, girls can be smaller. I, I'm a very average size person. And so people always say, it's funny because people will walk into a self-defense class and they've never seen me before. And I can see the look on their face, the kind of like looking past me for the real instructor. And I'm like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> Right, um, like, hey, um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they see that when I, it's a big joke in class because when I actually do my techniques, my voice, I'm shouting because that creates the intention within me to follow through. And that's something I never had. I have just learned how to do that in the last few years to really use my voice in an effective way. <laughs> Fantastic. I know Katie Schoenberg, she did uh, breath work yesterday. And part of it was you have to shout as loud as you can. And so for me, it feels like the theme of this week has been shout, like it's just let it all out. Uh, yes. We have another question from Neva. Uh, with regards to the physical self-defense mindset, how can that be translated to emotional self-defense for someone who's stuck in victim mode shown in the drama triangle? Um, okay, so... There's another principle that comes to mind that we use in self-defense training. Um, it's called the three C's. So we have physical techniques um, and then we have the principles that we always refer back to, to make them stronger and more powerful. So the three C's are referred to as clear control counter. So when we're teaching, when we're grabbed in any way, if there's anything intimidating pointed at you, your first goal, your first step is clear. So you need to clear that weapon or you need to clear that choke hold before you can do anything else. You need to be able to breathe, right? Then we talk about control where we say, okay, now we've cleared the threat, the initial threat. What part of this person do I have control over? 
And so you control a limb or you control the head. Once you've done that, then you can counter, meaning attack or strike or whatever you need to do to now get away. And so the three C's is something I actually can, again, I like to apply on an emotional level, on, on a mental level, even in coaching. Uh -huh. When we're faced with a challenge, what do you need to do first? You need to clear your headspace, right? right? Right now, what are we all feeling? Fear, anxiety, uh, overwhelm, unsurety. Well, I can't be constructive or positive until I clear that headspace and those limiting beliefs. Um, so once I clear that, then what's my next step? Control. So we often talk about, well, I don't have control over any of that. What do I have control over? And that's when you look within to my internal resources. What do I have within me? that I need to tap into. So we've cleared our headspace of anything that's not serving me. I'm taking control over my mindset, my perspective, what I do have control over, and then counter. So now I have this obstacle, right? I've got my headspace. I've taken control of what's within me. I'm approaching with a more positive uh, perspective, empowering perspective. Now I can counter my challenge. So that's how I the two to each world. That is, I mean, it's beautiful in, in its simplicity. Yeah, it's like, it makes total sense. You know, that internal, like, you know, to apply to the internal world as well. Like, how, what do I need to clear, right? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I want to I wanna share, too, uh, in an effort to create more community, get this fire started of, uh, you know, knowledge and ideas mm -hmm. being shared. Uh, there is a, I want to share the, the link to the, uh, the blog post, this, or your, your, your post. Uh, so if you have, so anyone listening, uh, if you have like question, further questions or you want to express your gratitude to Sonia for being here, if you could uh, please put those comments uh, in the blog, it helps create that sense of community. And if you have any questions for the questions for Sonia, uh, we can monitor them and they can be saved there so that future people uh, reading it would, uh, you know, get into it. Um, oh, wait, we have someone from Aditi, uh, Kim, 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 try. Kim, Kim, try. Yeah. got it. She said, I'm lucky to train with Sonia. And honestly, she has encouraged me to try something completely out of my comfort zone. Her amazing underlying coach coaching has kept me going and I'm now addicted. With the current situation, we're hoping she can teach us over Zoom. <laughs> is it, right? As we're missing weekly classes. Maybe this is a time she can do, uh, could be a way for her to inspire others globally. Sonia, it feels like you're being called forth in this hour. What is it, what's, what's next? Yeah, what do you see as, as next for you in your coaching practice and, and these ideas? I'll tell you what feels like it's next. Um, as you know, when, when you're trying out something new and you're creating new products and you're putting yourself out there, there is always this fear, this fear of judgment. Who will take me seriously? Who will buy my services? Who will pay for my services? And let me tell you right now in this moment with everything going on in the world, suddenly that fear has just gone out the window. Not only this huge realization has come, and again, my hope and my vision for the future, the, the strong passion that I've kind of felt within, the, this fire I've felt within, I have so much to pass forward, and, and it's just too powerful to keep to myself, and so I no longer am holding back. So that's the big shift that's happening for me personally in this moment. So in terms of my programs, I'm not holding back. There's so much in terms of teen empowerment, approaching schools with doing these short workshops, um, just going full on, going full on with coaching and personal safety training because the world needs it. That's amazing. And Coach Training EDU is so fortunate and lucky to have you as one of our trainers. Like it's, I mean, I can't tell you the depth of gratitude I feel for, for the energy you bring what you have, your story is so inspiring, especially being a dad of teenage girls and knowing what they're going through. Uh, 
it, it was just in life and then compounded with these challenges and knowing that internal struggle, I feel like what the combination of what, you know, the, the body with a coaching awareness is so incredibly powerful uh, and it's what's needed. You know, this, this sense of self uh, and other in an empowering way. It feels like the, like you are the embodiment of empowerment. Thank you. Um, and I have to express the same gratitude back to CTEDU um, because a huge shift occurred when I took your program. And nothing would stop me from showing up for class because I would learn so much and I was just given such an incredible space to grow as a coach and given so many tools. And when I had my bout of pneumonia, John, I still showed up from the hospital attached to an IV because I didn't want to miss that class. And that was the day I decided on my company name and I registered it the next day. And so I am so grateful to be part of this team. This team is just full of exactly everything I want to embody. Um, empowerment, resilience, strength, all of that. Compassion and a safe space. That is what CTEBU is all about. Yeah, thanks, Sonia. What's the, um, uh, what's the, the name? Share the name, please. Yeah. Yeah, so the name is Strength, Resilience and Balance, for short SRB. Um, and the theme behind it is that SRB are, is actually my initial, Sonia Rajpal Bhandari. So because it's my personal experience and my journey, I wanted the name to embody that. And over the last six years, that's what I've tapped into, inner strength. I, I never understood the word resilience before I did all this. And then I'm always, you know, looking for a balance between all of the roles and perspectives that I take on. So that's what it means to me. And I, I want to provide that to others. It is so, that's my life mission. That is what I, I realized as I was doing my coach training. But that is essentially my mission to pass forward those same life skills to others. Oh, thank you, Sonia. This is, this is amazing. And I feel like there is, there is more to come. Like we're, you know, and I know like once you get tapped into parent communities like this and start offering this online, I mean, I think, I know so many families who would be interested in doing, you know, looking at something like what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, this feels exciting. It feels like a, not, not just a, this isn't even like, uh, th this feels almost like a beginning, like a con not just a continuation, but, but a beginning of something, uh, something here. Uh, all right, so thank you everyone. Again, uh, here's, I'm gonna post that link again. Uh, to the blog. Uh, if you could uh, comment there, that would be that would be so helpful. And I really want to try to craft community and, and to nurture and cultivate community. Uh, and that's a way for us to do that. Sonia, thank you for showing up, for being who you are, for just this really inspiring message. Uh, let's, we have like one comment from, from Amy Sampton. Hi, Amy. There you are. Uh, and this is an excellent way, an excellent way to close. Uh, I totally ditto what Sonia just said, CTEDU. Oh, thank you. I mean, CTEDU has transformed my life. I like Sonia. Uh, I feel the fire burning within. I too have the passion to empower others and know it is my calling. Very inspirational, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this CTEDU family. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. It's such an honor. Thank you, John. And thanks everyone for showing up. Next week we have two more, uh, two more of these conversations uh, in our resiliency series. Thanks for being part of the CTU family.